Okay, it's 11. Um, does um, any of the speakers want me to hold or are you all ready to start? I think good we're good go. to go. I'll take that as a yes. Um, <laughs> so um, thanks and welcome everybody to our sixth ECS and Cloud Feedback Virtual Symposium. Um, so, uh, so the symposium has three AGU style talks. Um, as before, if you've been to these before, or, you know, we run this the same way most of these Zoom meetings go. If you have questions, type them into the chat at any time. Um, you should be muted um, and uh, you should not be able to unmute yourself. So uh, if you'd like to ask a question live, uh, raise your hand and we can unmute you. And then, um, and then you can ask your question via voice. Um, we'll have a general Q and A for a few minutes at the end uh, of the last talk. So if people have questions we didn't get to after the talk or general questions for all the speakers, stick around. Um, because of the AGU meeting, uh, we probably won't have an event in December. So the next one will be in 2021. Um, and lastly, email me or Christy if you want to give a talk. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Christy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, we've got three amazing speakers today. And our first speaker is uh, Ryan Scott. Ryan did his PhD at Scripps uh, and now is a research scientist at NASA Langley. Uh, Scott, take it away. I will give you a 10 minute warning. By and the you're way. muted, Ryan. Oh, Ryan. That would have been a boring talk. Still muted. <laughs> I can probably unmute you, hold on. All right, okay. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you're now unmuted. Great. Okay, awesome, okay, so. Yeah, so today I'll be presenting some work that I did as a postdoc with Joel Norris at Scripps. Um, it's work that I did with Tim Myers, uh, Mark Zelenka, Steve Klein, Mogusan, and Dave Doling. Um, okay. All right, and so of course, um, low clouds, they have a strong cooling effect on Earth's climate. Um, and low clouds are also one of the, the largest uncertainties and projections of, of future climate change. So an outstanding question in climate science is how will the uh, cooling radiative effect of, of low clouds change as the planet warms? Um, and to really tackle this question, we really need to understand how uh, low cloud radiative effects respond to, to climate perturbations across the planet and, and also have some sort of physical understanding of what the, the dominant underlying physical mechanisms are. Um, so you can estimate the, the low cloud feedback to warming as the change in radiative flux at the top of the atmosphere with the, for the change in global mean surface temperature. And it can be estimated as the sensitivity of the low cloud radiative effect to meteorology, which I have in, uh, enclosed in red here, multiplied by the change in meteorology with warming. And so in my talk, um, I'll be um, primarily focused on this uh, uh, term here in a red box, the DRDXI, so the sensitivity of low cloud radiative effects to meteorology. Um, and to, to look into this, we use observations. Um, in, in this talk, I'll prim primarily be looking at the series flux by cloud type data set, which provides uh, cloud fraction and radiative flux information stratified into uh, seven cloud top pressure bins and uh, six optical depth bins. Um, we also um, look at other data sets, but as I mentioned, I'll primarily be looking at series uh, for, for now. Um, the large scale meteorology is from ERA 5 and uh, NOAA Optimum Interpolation uh, version 2 SST. And so we consider large scale meteorological fields of the sea surface temperature, estimated inversion strength, uh, low level temperature advection or airflow over the SST gradient, um, the relative humidity in the free troposphere, um, the vertical velocity in the free troposphere and the near surface wind speed. And so what we do is uh, develop a model of the cloudy marine boundary layer, taking into consideration that um, ultimately the formation and dissipation of low clouds is 
controlled by turbulent processes that are extraordinarily difficult to observe directly on, a, on any sort of global scale. And uh, they're also not explicitly simulated by GCMs. And so um, clouds are supplied uh, with heat and moisture from the underlying surface, and they um, tend to become dried out by uh, turbulent mixing at cloud top. Um, and so we have evaluated the, the, the radiative sensitivity of low vertical turbulent fluxes of heat moisture and momentum among the sea surface, the marine boundary layer, and the free troposphere. Um, so we regress uh, monthly low cloud induced radiative flux anomalies at the top of the atmosphere onto detrended, de-seasonalized, de and standardized anomalies of the local large-scale meteorology. Um, so SST temperature advection and wind speed primarily determine upward fluxes from the surface into the marine boundary layer, while EIS, relative humidity at 700 millibars and omega at 700 millibars control downward fluxes into the marine boundary layer. Um, so a, a really important consideration that um, needs to be accounted for is that upper level clouds also respond to meteorology and they can obscure and reveal low level clouds. Um, and so the uh, changes in the upper level cloud fraction affect the retrieval of, of the low cloud fraction, um, which contaminates the inferred low cloud response. And so uh, basically, anywhere over the globe, the upper level cloud fraction will increase with free tropospheric humidity and ascent and uh, with SST in the, the deep tropics. So this is something that needs to be taken into account. And so to do this, we uh, consider non-obscured low cloud fraction anomalies. Um, we basically normalize the satellite retrieved cloud amount by the upper level clear sky fraction and use those in our regression. Um, so the resulting regression coefficients, which we also refer to as meteorological cloud radiative kernels, they quantify the sensitivity of the low cloud radiative effect to perturbations in each meteorological parameter with all of the other local meteorological, meteorological conditions held constant. They're uh, dominated by the shortwave flux component and a, a positive meteorological kernel um, implies a reduction in the low level cloud radiative effect and a positive anomaly of the net uh, downward radiation at the top of the atmosphere, whereas negative kernels imply enhancement of the low cloud radiative effect and a negative anomaly of the uh, TOA net downward radiation or a cooling effect on the climate. So we also summarize the results by uh, four climate regimes or cloud regimes um, they, that each contain different cloud types. So the first is the Eastern Ocean stratocumulus regime. The second is the trade cumulus regime. Um, and then we also have tropical ascent and mid-latitude regions. Um, and so these are partitioned using um, annual mean climatological thresholds of omega and EIS. Um, and so we see that over the, the planet, low clouds form and evolve in, in highly contrasting meteorological environments. And so it's interesting to examine the sensitivity uh, in each of these different base state uh, environments. And so if we, we look at the uh, cloud fraction uh, for stratocumulus and shallow cumulus retrieved by active sensors, they're generally consistent with uh, each of these regimes defined using meteorology. So the first parameter that we um, consider is uh, SST, which controls the temperature and uh, saturation vapor pressure in the marine boundary layer. Um, if you increase the SST, that uh, leads to an increase in the temperature and saturation vapor pressure in the marine boundary layer. And parcels that are rising into the cloud base will have a positive temperature perturbation with, with respect to the environment and release more latent heat, uh, which causes stronger overturning circulations uh, in the marine boundary layer that ultimately entrain more air from aloft and reduces the low level cloud amount. So, this is the, the low cloud rate of response to SST. On the left, we've got the amount component um, here as a little triangle. And on the right, the uh, optical depth component. And then this, the total is shown in the middle. And so uh, the map shown here um, and the regime averages on the left show that uh, with warmer for SST, we get reductions in the cloud amount and optical depth um, in Eastern Ocean Stratocumulus regime, which has a strong warming effect on the local climate. Uh, if we move to the trade cumulus areas, we see much weaker reductions, um, which could have to do with the cumulus valve mechanism or the fact that the marine boundary layer tends to decouple as um, the stratocumulus decks break up into to trade cumulus and uh, the marine boundary layer is infected over warmer tropical SSTs. We also see relatively weak and spatially variable behavior.
disappear over the minutes uh, and train less effective when the free troposphere is moist. So the second parameter that we evaluate is the uh, estimated inversion strength. So with a weak inversion, there's little stratification at cloud top and it's relatively easy to mix warm and dry air from the loft into the marine boundary layer. Um, a stronger inversion will require more turbulent kinetic energy or to mix air from lofts favoring more low cloud and optically thicker low cloud. Um, and so the estimated inversion strength um, emerges as a dominant control on low clouds, particularly in areas um, that are dominated by stratiform clouds and uh, particularly the Eastern Ocean stratocumulus and mid latitude regimes. And so with a stronger inversion, we see a, uh, a strong cooling effect. Um, in the tropics, there's, the response is considerably weaker and that's simply just a result of the fact that inversions tend to be weaker absent in these areas. So the third parameter we look at is the uh, advection over the SST gradient, which ultimately controls the stratification. Um, so cold airflow uh, or cold temperature advection corresponds to cold airflow over warmer water, which uh, destabilizes the surface layer um, and triggers uh, an upward flux of moisture to form clouds. Um, on the other hand, warm advection um, stratifies the marine boundary layer, reduces vertical mixing, and it cuts off clouds from the surface moisture supply and favors less op or less and optically uh, thinner low clouds. Um, and so the temperature advection also emerges as another um, important control on uh, low clouds, especially in the uh, Eastern Ocean stratocumulus and mid latitude regimes. Um, and so the reductions um, in low level cloud rate of effect with warm advection are dominated by the cloud amount component, and uh, it results in a net gain of energy by the local climate. And similar to EIS, uh, there's a, a weaker effect in the tropics. Um, and so the fourth parameter that we look at is the uh, free tropospheric relative humidity, um, which can, uh, can affect low clouds in two different ways. One is that um, a, more, a moisture free troposphere will emit more long wave radiation downward, which will reduce cloud top radiative cooling and the overturning circulations that uh, tend to supply clouds with moisture from the surface. And the other is um, that any air that's entrained into the cloud layer um, if it's really humid, it's not going to act to uh, reduce clouds through evaporation. Um, and so observations show that it's the second effect that dominates um, the reductions in evaporative cooling uh, for each um, per unit mass of entrained air. Um, so we see an increase in low level cloudiness in response to a more moist free troposphere. Um, it, this results in a moderate cooling effect on climate. Um, the, the response is largest in the stratocumulus regime, um, but sometimes we see an opposite signal. Um, but overall, um, there's a, a similar response in all of the uh, other regimes in terms of the uh, averages shown on the left here. So um, another parameter that we look at is the uh, omega at 700 millibars. Uh, the, uh, free tropospheric vertical motion ultimately influences the depth of the marine boundary layer. And so with an increase in subsidence, um, we see a, uh, lower cloud tops and uh, less and optically thinner low clouds. Um, and minutes. so this ultimately results in a, a weak warming effect on, um, on the climate system. Um, and the, the largest response is in the Eastern Ocean stratocumulus regime. Uh, which is dominated by reductions in cloud amount. Um, and the final parameter that we look at is the surface um, wind speed, which uh, stronger winds can uh, increase evaporation from the uh, ocean surface, resulting in a larger sea to air moisture flux and, um, and a deeper marine boundary layer with more cloud. And so the, uh, the largest response um, occurs in the trade cumulus regime. Um, there's a, a a large increase in the, the amount of low cloud um, in the tropics. And so this is an area where cold advection prevails and which destabilizes the boundary layer and aids the upward flux of moisture associated with stronger winds. And so ultimately the increase in cloud amount has a, a, a cooling effect on the tropical oceans um, as the low cloud amount increases. 
Um, as you move to the mid latitudes um, where warm advection prevails, um, the surface wind speed has a much weaker effect on low clouds. Um, and that's because warm advection stratifies the marine boundary layer and brings warm and moist air over cooler water, favoring a downward and not upward plate repeat flux. Rise, um, we used uh, satellite cloud observations in order to evaluate respond to perturbations uh, in the local background meteorology. Um, and so our study is the first to provide in ultimately provides a framework uh, along with physical insights to observationally constrain low cloud feedbacks. Um, and a critical factor there was accounting for free tropospheric cloud variability. Um, and so our results, our, our meteorological cloud rate of kernels can be used to evaluate low cloud feedbacks to uh, global warming as Tim Myers will talk about in the, in the next talk. Um, but it can also be used to evaluate uh, low cloud feedbacks to natural variability. So if you're interested, for example, in uh, ENSO or PDO or the AMO or any of those modes of climate variability, you could just regress the meteorology onto a, an appropriate index to get the low cloud rated of feedback to that mode. Um, another possibility is to, to use the kernels uh, in order to uh, evaluate trends in the climate um, and, and low clouds and the observational record. And finally, uh, they could also be used um, to evaluate the performance of, of models in, from GCMs all the way down to, um, to large eddy simulations. And so if, if you're interested in, in any of these results, you're welcome to, to uh, contact myself and Tim Myers. And, and all of the work that has uh, been presented here, you can also find it in my recent paper that's published in the Journal of Climate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, okay, so questions, if you have them, either type them in the chat or in the participants uh, tab, use the raise hand function to um, raise your hand and then we will unmute you. So uh, the opposing signs in DRD relative humidity in different regions is interesting. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think overall, so the, the effect of increased relative humidity, um, obviously the, the be, so mostly the opposite signal is in the stratocumulus regime and that's where the free troposphere is relatively dry. Um, so it could be the fact that the the other mechanism dominates for whatever reason it, it could just be due to the fact that um yeah the free troposphere is really dry um but yeah that, that could be uh, just the, the difference in the base state meteorological conditions cool uh, leo has a question yes uh, thank you ryan uh recently uh, a group uh, operating under uh, the WCRP came up with some uh, estimates of this feedback, uh, I think based maybe more on scaling up large eddy simulation results, but they came up with, a, I think for the tropical marine low cloud feedback, a number of about 0.25 watts per square meter per Kelvin. Uh, can you actually take the uh, procedure that you've used and uh, cite a number like that for comparison? I will uh, defer to Tim Meyer's talk for that. That's okay. what, so yeah, there's, we've got a, so this paper and a, and a companion paper that's been submitted to Nature of Climate Change. So I'll, yeah, I'll leave that for Tim to talk about. Okay, great, looking forward to that, thanks. Okay, awesome. Uh, Jonah Block Johnson has a question. Hi Ryan, thanks for the great talk. I was wondering if your low cloud feedback estimates are subject to the sort of regression dilution discussed in Preuss de Sesco et al, 2018. That is, since clouds influence these environmental variables at the same time that the environment variables influence the clouds, do the regressions yeah. reflect both correlations? Um, I'm not familiar with your paper that's being mentioned, but so our assumption and our analysis is basically that low clouds tend to respond to meteorology on a zero to 48 hour time scale, whereas radiative forcing of the environment tends to occur on uh, longer time scales than two days. 
So do you filter the data to fast time scales? No, we didn't. We didn't do any sort of filtering. Okay. Okay, we got time for one more quick question uh, from Peter. Thanks for the talk. I didn't follow if there is a way to disentangle causation. I guess it's related. The effect of SST changes on clouds versus the effect of logical factors on both SST and clouds. Hmm. I think this is a similar question to Jonas. Yeah, it, it seems to response to the previous question. Okay, so in the interest of time, we will move on. Uh, feel free to keep asking questions and uh, Ryan can either address them in the chat or uh, if people want to hang out at the end, uh, we can continue the conversation. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Tim Myers. He also did his PhD at Scripps, then was a postdoc at UCLA, uh, and then traded all that for the wonder, wonderful Central Valley and is now a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore. Take it away, Tim. All right, so if uh, everybody hears me okay, I'll get started. And so thanks for the invitation. So Ryan very nicely described the foundations of the work that I'm presenting on constraining low cloud feedbacks. Okay, so for some basic motivation, low cloud feedbacks are positively correlated with ECS across models. And in CMIP6, the spread of low cloud feedback and ECS have increased relative to CMIP5. This is illustrated in this scatter plot showing ECS versus near global marine low cloud feedback in models. And for example, you see a cluster of models in this upper right low cloud feedbacks are so strong. So how can we apply satellite observations to constrain this feedback and hence climate sensitivity? Well, we know that large scale meteorological forcing parameters control low cloud changes. And this means that given the sensitivity of low cloud radiative fluxes to meteorological cloud controlling factors from observed climate variability, that is given the meteorological cloud radiant of kernels that Ryan just discussed in the previous talk, um, given next how these factors will change in response to climate warming, which are resolved by GCMs, we can then predict the marine low cloud feedback. This is the mathematical framework. So we decompose the low cloud feedback at each ocean grid box between 60 south and north as follows using a Taylor series expansion. So R is the low cloud radiative of flux. X sub I is one of six cloud controlling factors and T is global mean surface temperature. So the first term on the right hand side, DRDX, that is the observation based meteorological cloud radiative of kernels that Ryan just presented. And as he mentioned, these are computed using regression of intraannual anomalies. DXDT is simply the change in cloud controlling factor per degree global warming predicted by 17 CMIT5 and CMIT6 models in abrupt four times CO2 simulations. The method predict out of sample extremes in the observational record. And in particular, we apply the method to predict low cloud changes associated with a Northeast Pacific marine heat wave. So these are the observed 2015 SST anomalies and the observed modus based low cloud radiative anomalies associated with a recent marine heat wave. And we see an extreme reduction in the cooling cloud radiative effect over the subtropical Northeast Pacific, which is coincident with the extreme ocean warming. And we can combine observations of cloud controlling factor anomalies with the 
meteorological kernels to predict the low cloud response. And this is the result, which you can see is right on the money. Um, and this is impressive since it's an out of sample prediction using an independent satellite data set. And then moreover, the year to year variability in the MODIS based low cloud radiative flux is very well predicted over the subtropical Northeast Pacific, where the SST perturbations span around 2.4 K. So here now are the estimates of the spatially resolved observationally constrained low cloud feedbacks from four different satellite data sets. And in every data set, we see that there's a positive feedback in the Eastern Ocean basins and the mid latitude North Pacific. The feedback is strongest in the stratocumulus regions. And there's also a weaker feedback in tropical regions characterized by trade cumulus. So which cloud controlling factors drive this feedback? This is a schematic depicting this. So these are the meteorological conditions inducing a positive low cloud feedback. SST increases everywhere, which then desiccates the clouds through an increase in entrainment drying. And in mid latitudes, the inversion strength robustly decreases in the perturbed climate in GCMs. And this induces an additional positive fad, positive feedback in the mid latitudes. And these are the meteorological conditions inducing a small but negative low cloud feedback. And there's only one, and that is in the tropics, inversion strength robustly increases in a perturbed climate in GCMs, which enhances cloudiness. And so next we partition the feedback into climate regimes corresponding to different cloud types. And we do that using thresholds of omega 700 and the estimated inversion strength, as Ryan discussed. These are the regime average feedbacks and observations in GCMs. So the large blue symbols are the observationally constrained feedbacks and the large and red, large um, red and orange symbols are the ensemble means of CMIP 5 and 6. And then each feedback is further decomposed into an, its amount and optical depth components. The observational air bars here denote 90% confidence and the GCM bars span the full range of feedbacks. So we predict positive feedbacks for both strata cumulus and mid latitudes. These feedbacks result from roughly equal positive amount and optical depth contributions. And this is in contrast to CMIT-5, which simulate on average a negative mid-latitude optical depth feedback, which leads to an overall near zero feedback in this regime. And then on the other hand, CMIT-6 on average produce a positive mid-latitude feedback similar to observations, owing to an increase in their optical depth feedback relative to CMIT-5. And then trade cumulus feedbacks in observations are scattered around zero and much weaker than those of strata cumulus. And the feedbacks in regions of tropical ascent are similar. And this is qualitatively consistent with feedback estimates from large eddy simulations. And here are the feedbacks scaled by planetary fractional area. So we find that the strata cumulus and mid latitude cloud feedbacks provide similar contributions to the global mean. And this leads to a near global feedback shown on the far right that is positive in all data sets. And we can statistically combine satellite data sets and the near global feedback estimates to produce a best estimate and it's 90% uncertainty range that is shown here. And interestingly, what you can see is that there's a part of the CMIP6 distribution with a near global feedback beyond the limit of the best 
estimate. And this is for a couple of reasons. So first, the CMIP-6 models realistically produce a positive mid-latitude feedback, unlike CMIP-5. And second, both CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 models trade cumulus feedback is inflated relative to observations. And if you're curious, these are the individual CMIP-6 models in this upper range. So what do these results imply about climate sensitivity? We'll use two methods here. And the first method is an emergent constraint approach. So let's go back to a plot from the intro showing ECS versus the near global marine low cloud feedback in models. And now I superimpose the best estimate of the feedback in its 90% range based on the satellite observations. And I also show a histogram in Gaussian PDF best fit of the CMIP prior distribution of ECS. And we can derive a constrained PDF of ECS by combining the best estimate of the feedback along with statistical information across models that is shown here. And under this constraint, there's only a 3.5% chance that ECS is greater than 5K and an 8% chance that it is less than 2.5K. In other words, we can say that models with very low or very high climate sensitivities are likely unrealistic. And for for the second method, we provide an update to a recent Bayesian estimate of climate sensitivity derived from multiple lines of evidence by Sherwood et al., otherwise known as the WCRP ECS assessment that Leo mentioned. And this is the new gold standard. Sounds good. This is the new gold standard of ECS estimates. And the Sherwood baseline PDF of climate sensitivity is shown here, which spans a 66% range of 2.6 to 3.9 K. And Sherwood et al. derive a near global marine low cloud feedback of 0 0.37 watts per meter squared per K. But we argue that our estimate of 0 0.2 is more realistic for two reasons. So first we provide explicit evidence that the trade cumulus feedback will likely be weaker than the strata cumulus feedback in agreement with large eddy simulations. And then second, we consider the most comprehensive set of cloud controlling factors of all observation-based feedback studies. And so we replace the Sherwood et al. low cloud feedback with our value, leaving all other terms in the PDF calculations of climate sensitivity unchanged. This updated range is displayed in blue and our estimate points to a climate sensitivity near 3K and reduces its uncertainty. And then finally, I point out that the central value and width of this updated range are smaller than the ECS distribution following the emergent constraint approach shown here in green. And that is to say, there are major limitations to inferring real world climate sensitivity using emergent constraints from a single study. And so it's important that any future study attempting to robustly constrain climate sensitivity should consider the large body of evidence that has already been assessed, such as in the WCRP ECS assessment of Sherwood et al. And thanks so much. I will leave you with this summary slide. Thank you so much, Tim. That was great. Uh, okay, so we have, Oh, this is still updating. Uh, so we have uh, one question from uh, Rob uh, and Rob Wood asks, 
Uh, nice analysis. Why are Patmos and Iskip estimated feedbacks in stratocumulus regions much greater than those from Modis series? That's a good question. Um, if we go back, one reason, one thing I will note is that while they uh, are stronger, they are not statistically different from modus and series. But you might also ask, what does time period have to do with this? And the answer of why ISKIP and Patmos are tend to be a little bit stronger is due to time period. So we can assess this by in, examining the feedbacks just based on ISKIP here, the circle and the squares, but using two different time periods. So you can see that the feedbacks based on the um, earlier ISKIP time period are, period are a bit stronger than the ISKIP feedbacks from the later time period, though the, they are statistically indistinguishable. But I'm not quite sure what is inherent in ISKIP or Patmos that would make the feedback stronger, however. Cool. OK, uh, Nick asks, can this method constrain cloud feedbacks at latitudes uh, higher than 60 degrees? In Zelenka et al., the largest difference between CMIP5 and CMIP6 looks to be further south than 60 degrees south. Right, that's a good question. The passive satellite data sets that we examine here are going to be much more unreliable outside of 60 north and south because the surface Temperature is, tends to be uh, much colder, obviously, than whole, uh, equator word of 60. And then also the fact that um, you have sea ice, which can contaminate the results. But from my recollection, the Zelenka et al. 2020 paper showing that large differences between CMIP 6 and 5 did apply a cloud controlling factor analysis um, that I actually performed for that paper. And that was within, between 30 south and 60 degrees south. So, so, so I think um, there is consistency. Hmm. Okay. More of a statement than a question from Joel. Great presentation, Tim. Uh, and a question from Michael. Uh, great talk. For the stratocumulus feedbacks, do you have any thoughts on why the observations show an equal contribution from fraction and amount, whereas the model's feedback is dominated by the amount? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, physically, based on the physical mechanisms that Ryan mentioned, um, we have reason to believe that as SST increases and the entrainment rate also increases that would tend to suppress low cloud cloudiness including cloud amount and cloud optical depth on the other hand the the models as you point out they're probably the mechanism is probably very different in models and um there's been work work shown by um some people in, um showing that cloud cloud base cloudiness, cloud-based cloud fraction in models is very sensitive to surface warming owing to something inherent with their parameterizations. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what. Interesting. Uh, question from Martin. Very interesting, Tim. Did you consider potential dependencies between CMIP6 and CMIP5 models in your emergent constraint analysis? If yes, how? Could you repeat? Repeat that one more time, the difference between CMIP5 and CMIP6, in what regard? Did you, did you consider potential dependencies between CMIP5 and CMIP6 models in your emergent constraint analysis? Right, so were there, we didn't explicitly partition the results, emergent constraint results between CMIP5 and CMIP6, so I can't quantitatively 
answer that. But just looking at this, if you compare CMIP5 and CMIP6, you could imagine that it's clear that the CMIP6 climate sensitivities are higher um, as shown by several studies now. And so that means that our, if we were to only use the CMIP6 distribution, our constrained ECS range would increase relative to just use, to using CMIP5 and CMIP6. So qualitatively, that's what I expect. Cool. Okay, we got time for one quick question from Kyle. Um, I was wondering if you've thought about whether the feedback estimates depend on the pattern effect. That is, recent if recent patterns of SST and EIS trends continue, would this change your feedback and ECS estimate? Our feedback estimates are dependent on the pattern effect insofar as the pattern effect is is in the abrupt four times CO2 simulations. And my understanding is that the pattern effect is gonna be second order to uniform surface warming in the abrupt four times CO2 simulations. And so that's the best I can answer. We do I consider, so. I, I can mention one more thing, which is that in our uncertainty analysis, we do, we do consider the intermodel spread in changes in cloud controlling factors with warming, which would include intermodel differences in the pattern effect with warming across models. And so to the extent that mo intermodel uncertainty in the pattern effect is captured by models, that is inherent in our analysis. Okay. Um, okay, well, in the interest of time, we need to move on so we can continue this discussion uh, afterwards. So our last speaker, uh, is uh, Jess Tierney. She has a PhD from Brown University, was a postdoc at Lamont, and spent some time as an assistant scientist at Woods Hole, and is now an associate professor at the University of Arizona. Uh, and amongst other things, she is a Massel Wayne Medal winner uh, from the AGU. And Jess is going to talk to us about um, the paleoclimate side of ECS, which I think follows nicely on Kyle's question, how do we know what the large scale meteorological conditions and climate are going to do on long time scales. Take it away, Jess. All right. Thank you, Christy and Andrew, for inviting me to uh, this webinar. It's been pretty, I've learned a lot so far. Uh, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my screen here. And in my talk, we're going to talk about paleoclimates, which I think are becoming you know, more and more important in terms of this problem of constraining ECS and also the strength of cloud feedbacks. In terms of out of sample tests, paleoclimate is going to be the mother of all out of sample tests, right? Because we're looking at really large changes in the climate system. And so I want to show you what we can gain from looking at a glacial or a cold climate, in particular the last glacial maximum. And um, I want to acknowledge uh, my co-author here, Zheng Zhu. I'm going to show some new results uh, that Zheng, uh, Zheng Zhu's at, at NCAR has put together with CSM2 in this talk. Um, and so this really is a joint presentation. And if you have any very hard questions, please save them for Zheng, who I think is on the call. OK, um, so we're going back in time now to the last glacial maximum. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, this is what the world looked like 20,000 years ago. Uh, we have very large ice sheets uh, covering North America, the Laurentide Ice Sheet and Eurasia. Uh, it's obviously a huge climate change. We know greenhouse gas concentrations very precisely thanks to the ice cores. And they tell us that CO2 was 185 ppm, so, so very low. Uh, so this is a big change relative to pre-industrial climates. And for this reason and the fact that it's actually not so long ago, this is uh, for a very long time been a target for paleoclimate study, uh, you know, going back into the 1970s and we see the work of Climap, the Climap group uh, really focused on trying to map out what the climate looked like in the LGM, including the pattern of sea surface temperature change, which you can see in their map on the lower right hand corner now. And, um, and so this, is, this has been studied for a long time. 
And in addition to just sort of trying to get a picture of what the climate of the LGM looks like, it has uh, for many decades also been used to test climate sensitivity. Uh, so we can look back at this paper by Suki Manabi and Tony Broccoli from 1985, where they actually use the climate patterns to try and test two versions of their model. Incidentally, one that has fixed clouds and one that has variable clouds. And so they actually want, you know, we're, we're sort of coming full circle here. This is, you know, 40 years ago, pe people are trying to do this already to use the paleoclimate data to actually ask, what is the strength of cloud feedback? Um, and you can see from the poll quote that an attempt was made uh, to do this uh, and emphasis on the attempt was made. So they didn't feel completely confident in their conclusions in part because our understanding of the climate change at the LGM was still a bit fuzzy. Uh, there were large error bars in the climate reconstruction. Um, and so, but nonetheless, the effort was there. So we're really following on tradition here. I, now from the recent Sherwood et al. paper, um, paleoclimate plays a big role in actually providing a constraint on possible values for ECS. And in that paper, they look at both cold climates and warm climates. Um, but I really like this quote that, you know, that the last glacial maximum gives us, of course, now my, my window is blocking it, so I can't read it, but you can read it for yourself that, um, you know, the last glacial maximum is really a powerful constraint on, I, I would say for sure the low end of ECS because it's a cold climate, but potentially also the high end as argued by the Sherwood et al. authors that the limits on the constraints of cooling, you know, how cold the LGM can be are a fundamental limit on how high ECS can be. So then the question arises, what are the limits on LGM cooling? How cold was the LGM? And over the last few decades, there's been a number of estimates of LGM cooling that are out there. And there's actually quite a range. So if you look at some of the error bars here, you can see that um, you know, we're getting anywhere from actually you know, a minimum of two degrees Celsius cooling, global cooling to a maximum of eight. And uh, so in the AR5, the IPCC quoted a range, a 90% confidence interval of uh, minus three to minus eight degrees C. You translate that into ECS, you basically get the whole span, right? Anything from really, really low uh, to extremely high. So the constraints on LDM cooling weren't very tight. Um, and so this is a problem that we revisited recently in providing a new estimate of LGM cooling based on data assimilation. And in this approach, which was published um, earlier this fall in Nature, we actually used uh, both an updated proxy database, but also simulations from the isotope enabled uh, CSM 1.2, combining those estimates together to create full field views of the change in LGM sea surface temperatures and also in the change in LGM surface air temperatures. Um, and so when we, we could, this way we have, you know, a spatially complete view. So this avoids problems that in the past are related to scaling paleoclimate data up or into a spatially complete estimate. Um, and so our estimate of global cooling, which is in the center of this plot, has a median of minus 6.1. Um, and you can compare that both to what the model does by itself, which is on the right, and what the data would say by themselves with some assumptions there actually um, about seasonality and scaling and things. So you can see the data by themselves have a pretty large error bar with those kinds of assumptions. Um, and so the DA is, you know, as expected, kind of uh, coming in in between the model and the data there, uh, but it completely overlaps with the data range there, um, basically this value around minus six degrees Celsius. And so with this new estimate, we can then now, you know, narrow our constraint on LGM cooling to minus six, uh, which incidentally agrees with most of those studies that you see there on the right hand side. Um, including BE18 Bariter's study that's based on noble gases, so completely independent from our analysis. So it does seem like there's an emerging consensus here that the last glacial maximum um, was about minus six degrees cooler or so. So with this sort of tighter estimate on LGM cooling, we can then return to the calculation of ECS. And, and we're going to do this sort of using the PaleoSense framework, where the numerator is the change in temperature, which we get from PaleoDA, and the denominator is the four scenes and does include, you know, some feedbacks as well. 
Um, and so in the denominator, we have basically three terms that we considered in our paper, um, the forcing associated with greenhouse gases, which we know really well because we know what greenhouse gases were and that can be calculated from equations. Um, the forcing associated with the ice sheets, right? So the ice sheets uh, themselves are obviously imposing a large radiative forcing on the climate system. Um, that we do have to get from models. So we here use a multi-model mean from um, CMIP uh, five and six sort of class models that have run an LGM simulation. And then finally, there is potentially a forcing from dust aerosols. And there's kind of a wide range of estimates of that, anything from something very small to something relatively large. And for those last two terms, I just wanted to show you kind of what's out there in the literature. Um, and so the top panel is the synthesis of the radio forcing of the LGMI sheet from the work of Pascal Braconet. And um, it's interesting that the models kind of cluster in these two areas. So you've got on the right a group of models that kind of have anywhere from minus two and a half to you know, minus 3.7 watts per meter squared forcing. Um, we did a partial radio perturbation experiment to nail what CSM 12's uh, value was. It's right there in the middle of the distribution. And then there's these three models that are kind of off to the left there with extremely strong ice sheet forcing, MIROC, IPSL, and MPI. And then in the bottom, the dust forcing. So there there's fewer models here that have sort of looked at this, the impact of potential dust aerosols. It's just um, you know, as a reminder, the LGM is thought to have been dustier. We have paleoclimate evidence that it's dustier. Uh, and, but you can see that actually you know, three models kind of cluster near zero. They don't indicate that it's that much of a forcing. And the only one that's sort of showing a really strong forcing here of minus two watts per meter squared is actually a pretty old simulation done with an intermediate complexity model. Um, so most modern uh, models are kind of clustering to the right here. Was the, this is a more minor term than greenhouse gases and ice is what it's looking like. But we sampled all these uncertainties um, in a Monte Carlo fashion to create our sort of PDF of climate sensitivity. And I'll just emphasize that this is an empirical PDF. So it, 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 we didn't put any prior constraints on the shape of this curve, which is kind of why it looks kind of a little bit goofy compared to what you're used to seeing. And you can actually see those two clusters of ice sheet, right? The, the, those mo the two clusters of model that have a strong ice sheet uh, you know, forcing and a weak one, they give it a sort of double humped look. Uh, but in any case, the median is 3.4 degrees Celsius. Is, with a 95% CI of two and a half to four and a half. So that's a relatively sort of normal estimate of ECS, if you will. And we find, um, you know, even when we test things like the efficacy of ice sheets, it's very unlikely uh, that our LGM constraint is, is consistent with an ECS higher than five. And it's very unlikely that it would support an ECS less than two, which I think is pretty consistent with what Tim just um, mentioned as well from the cloud observational constraints. So we can compare to, uh, our LGM constraint to the AR5 range, CMIP5 models and CMIP6 models. And we can see that we support uh, more of a CMIP5-like range there. Um, and again, very little chance that ECS is lower than two or higher than five. So now at the last few slides, I wanna show you what happens though, when you do use a high ECS model to simulate the last glacial maximum, and we're going to do this with CSM2, the newest generation of NCARS model that, that Jung has made. You can see that in every iteration of the, of the community air system model, ECS has gone up. Um, and CSM2 is one of those models that has an ECS that um, is, is pretty, pretty high, above five, right? So we want to see what happens when you ask this model to simulate the last glacial maximum. And this is what happens. So um, basically, let me walk you through what we're looking at here. So the proxy estimate in gray is the data only estimate from our LGM nature paper. So this is without the data assimilation just to keep things separate. So that's at 5.6 um, medium value or so with a 95% CI. And um, then we have three color lines. We have CSM1, that's the simulation uh, that we did for our LGM paper, and that's in blue. It's coming in right at the lower end of the proxy estimates. 
Um, and then we have the red line, that's CSM2 with CAM6, and you can see that it is going extremely cold and sort of plateauing at a value around 11 and a half, minus 11 and a half degrees Celsius, uh, which suffice to say is, is way too cold. There's, there's no, even if you were to compare this to any of those other estimates I showed earlier in the talk, there's no way <laughs> that the proxy data are consistent with minus 11 and a half. Um, and, but you know what's interesting is if we knock out CAM6, right, and put CAM5 back, then we have the orange line. And actually that simulation looks really good. So this immediately isolates the problem to the atmosphere, which is no surprise. Um, and so John did a nice diagnosis of what's going on here. So first of all, if we break down, what is the effect of forcing in CSM2 in the LGM simulation? We did this using slab ocean model experiments. It's actually lower than CSM one, right? Um, by almost a whole, you know, uh, watts per meter squared there. So you can see that and that's actually due to updates in the land model in CSM2. The, the ice sheets are less bright. So the forcing is lower, but the cooling is much bigger, which means the feedbacks have to be stronger. And so if we look at the um, effective climatic feedback in CSM2 versus CSM1, there's a difference of about uh, 0.4. And it turns out that in, that difference is entirely attributable to maybe unsurprisingly the shortwave cloud feedbacks. So that's the middle column on the bottom, where we can see that CSM2 has a very strong shortwave cloud feedback in the LGM, uh, 0.4 more than the CSM1. And just for comparison, on the right hand side, we can see the shortwave cloud feedback in the abrupt four times CO2 experiments with each model. And it's slightly higher overall in both CSM1 and 2, but interestingly, the difference is the same. So there's some symmetry actually between you know, the shortwave cloud feedback in this cold climate and in the warm climate. Um, and when you look at the patterns of the cloud feedback in action, the LGM on the left, and the four times CO2 on the right. Um, so you can see in the LGM the strong impact of, again, those subtropical low clouds really uh, kicking up and, comp and contributing to the shortwave cloud feedback. That's true in CSM1 as well. It's less intense. Um, it is interesting to note that the pattern of cloud feedback is actually somewhat different between the cold climate and the warm climate, even though the difference between the two models in each climate state is similar. Um, so the takeaway is, well, first of all, the LGM cooling, the magnitude of LGM cooling does scale with ECS in a general sense, but particularly with the community earth system model, as you can see here. Um, and, and as we've just seen that if you take a model with an ECS of over five and ask it to simulate the LGM, it's, it's far too cold, which we think provides an easy first order constraint on ECS. And it's very likely that CSM2 has a, it's ECS and it's shortwave cloud feedback is just too strong. So with that, I will say thanks, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Jess. It's a very nice talk. Okay, so we already have um, we already have a question from Dan Lund. Nice talk. WCRP had a maximum likelihood for ECS from the LGM about one degree less than your central estimate. Do you know why they differ so much? Yeah, sure. WCRP's range of LGM cooling was um, more in the minus three to minus four range. So I'm guessing that that is probably part of the reason rather than that minus six estimate um, that we're using here. So that that report was, was done before, you know, obviously um, done long before we publish our LGM paper. So I think that that's mostly from the paleo estimate of cooling. Cool. That makes sense. Um, Amy Clement has a question. Great talk, Jess. Patterns of cloud feedbacks look quite different in the Indian Ocean between LGM and four times CO2. Any way to use paleo to constrain patterns? Yes, great question. Yeah, so I was also really taken with the differences in the pattern of the forcing between those two climate states. Um, I think there is a way. So certainly um, our, for the LGM, our DA you know, provides some constraints on the pattern of SST uh, change 
However, because it's a data simulation, it's inheriting some of that from the model. Um, but I would also say that beyond the cold climate, um, you know, we can use past warm climates in particular, like the Pliocene, for example, to look at the pattern changes. Um, and broadly written, you know, the data can provide uh, constraints on that, such as whether, you know, the Eastern Equatorial Pacific is warmer than the West or in the Indian Ocean, uh, vice versa. And so the data are, um, do provide constraints on that. And um, we can use also, you know, beyond data simulation, we can use things like reduced space methods potentially uh, to get at the spatial patterns. So that is definitely something that we're interested in doing and in refining. Um, so yes, that, that's definitely the next goal. <laughs> Uh, Steve Klein uh, says, uh, great talk. I encourage you to insert your estimates of LGM cooling into the Sherwood et al. 2020 calculation. Uh, sure, absolutely. <laughs> I just saw Tim do that. So I thought that was pretty cool. So yeah, we could easily do that. Cool. Um, well, it's 12, so I want to thank everybody, uh, especially thank the speakers for accepting our invitations and giving three great talks, which I think actually worked really well together, uh, despite the very different time scales involved. Um, so everybody's free to go, but uh, if you're interested, we're going to hang around for another couple of minutes to uh, keep talking about, uh, about the topics presented here. And, Maybe keep answering some of the questions in the chat. So maybe, so again, same thing. If you want to speak up, raise your hand in the participants. Uh, if not, I'll just keep on reading from the chat. Where were we? Um, okay, Peter Watson for Jess. Not knowing much about paleo data, could you briefly say why different database estimates uh, of global mean temperature change so much? What do you think would happen if you did your DA with those data sets? Yeah, so one, there's a couple. There's a couple things. So first of all, um, the the climap sort of you know compilation of LGM SST data and then the Margo in 2008. A lot of it was based on assemblage data. So basically uh, transfer functions of, you know, like the, these four amps prefer this temperature and so on. Um, and we didn't include that data in our analysis in our paper this year. Uh, the reasons for that were um, mainly that I didn't have a Bayesian framework to interpret them. But uh, one key aspect of that data that contributes, uh, that contributed to previous estimates being not as cold as ours is that um, they, those data have a far less of tropical cooling uh, than we get from the geochemical indicators. And some of those data actually show warm subtropical gyres like warmer than present, which we don't have many reasons to believe that that's correct. So, so in part, it, it comes from the type of data you're using. Um, we also updated the forward models of, of the SST proxy data sets that we're using. Uh, which did change a, f a little bit, um, basically leads us to a tropical cooling that's closer to minus three, which is um, we think like maybe a more reasonable value uh, versus previous synthesis are, are coming in about half that. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean, certainly if we've did DA with the older data sets, actually that's, that's been done um, by Julia Hargraves Who's on this? Who's on this call right now? And James on and have done that, and um, di slightly different framework. And yeah, you you would get less of a global cooling. But I think that um, we feel better about this minus six value, you know, especially because it's it's now supported by some independent estimates. Mm. Right, like the noble guesses. Yeah. Uh, so here's a related question. I'm going to jump around a bit. Uh, what what if you did DA with CSM2? So this is from Michelle Petrini. Um, are there areas showing particularly high difference, such as the North Atlantic, between CSM2 CAM5 and CSM2 oh, CAM6? Is DMAP behavior different between the two runs? Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I mean, in um, 
So in the paper that is under review right now in GRL, which is led by Jung, we do look at the spatial offset between CSM2 and the proxies. And CSM2 is, is pretty much, it's, it's way cold everywhere. I'm, I'm not sure uh, if there's one region that is colder than the other, but it seems to be pretty consistent that the proxy data are warmer than almost any place in CSM2. So if we, um, you know, obviously if we did a DA with that, the, the proxies would drag the posterior to less cold, but it would be very difficult because you're starting uh, from values that are just, you know, way below um, where the proxies are. So we, we wouldn't want to, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do DA with CSM2. <laughs> I guess that answers then Lund's question about doing DA with CSM2. Uh, okay, I don't think I want to, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> at least it didn't snowball, you know, uh, which I think Julia was uh, mentioning something in the chat here about IPSL. And, and I heard that as well, that apparently, um, you know, they're having problems with sea ice, you know, kind of starting to run away. And it's interesting to note that a lot of modeling groups, especially those with high ECS models, have not submitted an LGM simulation yet. So I suspect that CSM2 is not the only one with, with a problem. Um, that's interesting. So that's sort of an independent constraint that also helps to rule out the high ECS models. Cool. Uh, OK, question from Kara Hartig. Uh, as you mentioned, CAM5 versus CAM6 seems to be the biggest issue with CSM representation of the LGM. What about CAM was changed, do you think, that uh, led to these issues? Just the shortwave cloud effect? Yeah, I think updates to the cloud parameterizations is it. Um, we weren't able to find a major, I mean, you can see that it, in that slide I showed that it accounts for basically all of the feedback difference between CSM one and two. So we're pretty sure that that's it. Um, in terms of the details of what was changed, I, I don't know. Um, if Jung's on the call, he might be able to speak to that or drop info in the chat, exactly what changed between 1.2 and two. Um, but yeah, we're pretty sure that it's, it's, it's the clouds, um, but I don't know exactly what was changed. So hopefully he'll chime in if he's still around. Maybe he left though. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks just for the nice talk. I have some very preliminary results showing that maybe the ice nucleation scheme makes a big difference between the two versions of the model. So mixed phase clouds in the Southern Ocean. How oh, interesting. Okay, cool. Um, so Gavin had a question about IPSL, but I think between Jess's answers and Julia's uh, later in the chat, it's been answered. Um, okay, Kyle has two questions. Two questions, okay. Does your LGM effective ECS estimate include adjustments for how feedbacks depend on mean state? That may be another difference from the WCRP assessment. And two, did I follow correctly that CSM's two net climate feedback for DLGM is less negative, higher effective ECS than other four times CO2? This seems counter to what we expect for feedback dependence on mean state temperature. Uh, net feed, okay, well, okay. First part of the question, right. Yeah, we did not adjust how, we didn't make any adjustments for the, the LGM mean state. So it was literally that simple calculation there. So no um, pattern adjustment or anything else like this. The second part, I'm just checking my slides. Um, the total effective feedback is, is um, more, no, so I didn't have in my slide, I don't have the total feedback for the 4X CO2. Um, we all, I only compared the cloud and the shortwave cloud, the shortwave cloud feedback is stronger under the abrupt 4x CO2, uh, which I think makes sense. Um, although the difference is not, well, I guess it is kind of big. 
Um, Jung, do you know about the difference between the total feedback between the LGM and the forex CO2? Because I only yeah. put in the total for the LGM. I think in all the LGM simulations, it's very clear that the CI albedo if uh, feedback is greater in the LGM simulations. That's consistent between many versions of CSM models and maybe with other uh, models. So that's why in the LGM simulation, we have this larger temperature response because again, the nonlinearity in the CIS albedo effect. But when you compare the different model versions, the, the IS albedo feedback is actually similar between different model versions. So the major difference is still cloud feedback. Cool. Um, okay, so looks I'll give a question for Tim. Is Tim still on the chat? Yes. I'm here. Okay, so uh, question from Michael. I really like the check with the 2015 marine heat wave. Have you looked at other marine heat wave events as well? We did not actually, but that would be something very interesting to do. The Northeast Pacific marine heat wave has been one of the most discussed and prominent. And because it was in a, uh, strata, a very important stratocumulus region, we thought that would just be a um, very important heat wave to consider, but the other heat waves would be really nice to look at as well. So thanks for that suggestion. Well, since I have you, I have a question for you. In the uncertain, maybe, maybe I just didn't understand this. In the, when you did the CMIP um, spread in net feedbacks, did you partition that between uncertainty from sensitivity to uh, cloud controlling factors and, un and uncertainty from how the cloud, cloud controlling factors evolve with global temperature? So you're, are you referring to the spread among models? Yes, because you can't get it from observations. Well, you can't get the second part from observations. Right, but there, so what I'm, what I'm asking it is like, basically we have a spread among, we have our 90% uncertainty range of our feedback estimates. And then we also have the feedbacks, the, the, the spread of feedbacks among models, so. Oh. I was as I guess I guess both. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So like with our, with respect to our uncertainty calculations, we do consider both the uncertainty in the, the meteorological kernels and the uncertainty in changes in cloud controlling factors with warming, and the uncertainty in the changes in cloud controlling factors we estimate as the intermodel spread among the 17 models. And so we do consider both. And it turns out that the uncertainty in the meteorological kernels dominate the total uncertainty. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. That was my question. Um, cool. Well, I think, well, there's some good discussions in the chat that I'm not going to interrupt about. Um, what do we do with the models that aren't able to simulate the LGM? Uh, but other than that, is there a question that I've missed? I think we should probably Anybody? wrap up. It's almost 1250. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank the speakers again and we will see you in January. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.